Zapraszam. Uwaga. Szanowni Państwo, chciałam bardzo serdecznie przywitać w Centrum Dialogu imienia Marka Edelmana na niezwykłym spotkaniu z cyklu Tłumaczenie Świata. Zaproszenie na to spotkanie zechcieli przyjąć arcybiskup metropolita łódzki Grzegorz Ryś. Oraz rabin gminy wyznaniowej żydowskiej Beit Hadikwa w Buenos Aires, rabin Abraham Skórka. Szanowni Państwo, z powodu organizacyjnych całe spotkanie odbędzie się w języku angielskim. Mam nadzieję, że macie Państwo osoby, które potrzebują tłumaczenia, mają słuchawki. Także za chwilkę przejdziemy na język angielski. Będzie można w drugiej części pytania zadawać również w języku polskim, jeśli ktoś z Państwa będzie chciał. So, I would like to thank you very much for that you decided to uh, to join us during this uh, conversation. It is a great honor to host you here in the Marek Edelman Dialogue Center. Uh, our meeting. Uh, we named uh, to understand brothers, to understand brothers. So first of all, I would like to ask you, what does it mean the brother for you? We have, uh, we know uh, that the Pope uh, John Paul II uh, pointed the name of the brothers in faith. But uh, it is very interesting, is it any difference how to understand this expression Jews and Christians. So it is a question to both of you. Rabbi, all the braver. How I understand the expression our older brothers coined by the Pope uh, John Paul II during his uh, visit uh, to the synagogue of Rome. Brother is something very special. It's not merely uh, to say, okay, you are my brother, because all of us in our human condition, in accordance on the first chapter of Genesis, all of us are brothers. But I felt the expression of Saint John Paul II in another way. The beginning of Christianity was in Yehuda. In Yehuda, the first Christians uh, were Jews. Uh, in the time of Jesus, uh, were all kind of, uh, of uh, let's say, I would not uh, like to use the word sect. I don't like to use uh, this word, but let's say were streams all kind in Jewish belief, in Jewish faith, were Pharisees, were tzedukim, as we say in, in Hebrew, perushim, Pharisees in English, were isim that we don't know exactly were uh, who they they were as but they were described by Josephus Flavius and were a great testimony of the uh, the different movements in Jewish faith in the first century are the Dead Sea Scrolls and are all the what we call in the Jewish studies, the uh, Apocrypha, the books that were are, uh, outside the canon, the traditional 
a Jewish canon of the Bible. For instance, the, the Book of Jubilees. This shows us that there was a, a whole spectrum of, uh, um, of faith in the frame of the Jews on that time. And afterwards, Christianity developed its own way uh, from this root. So really, we are brothers in the deepest way, in the deepest sense of the word brother, because the rabbinic Judaism, which is my Judaism, which is the Judaism of the uh, of the Jews of today is a development of one movement in the Yehuda of the first century. Yehuda, I mean, the Judah, yeah, of the first century, and in a parallel way, and afterwards, divergent in some way of Christianity, but. The roots, the values, the spiritual values, they has, it used to be said in German, the Weltanschauung of Jews and Christian is, uh, and Christians is very close, is very similar. We can, we have really differences, of course. Uh, the faith in uh, Jesus, you... Uh, we will you, follow this. Uh, for us, yeah. For you is the son of God in some way. It, it's a theme in itself that if you wish, you can uh, speak about afterwards. But uh, regarding uh, the faith in a transcendental, in a transcendental God, God of transcendental, not the transcendental God, regarding the faith in the sanctity which is in each human being, regarding the respect that one has to have regarding the other. These are very common values that we are sharing because that, and in this sense, I feel that the uh, we are brothers, and two think two uh, points more. I have a continuous uh, um, uh, correspondence with the Pope. When he uh, writes to me, he begins, "My beloved brother," and when I write to him, I begin th the way that. I write to him is my beloved brother. And that's true. It's a really feeling of brotherhood. It's not merely a word. Um, and the second point is this. The book of Genesis teaches us that the relationship between brothers is not an easy task, because that we clashed during 2,000 years one with the other in different points, where, where moments of understanding and were moments of clashes. But the end of Genesis is that all the family of Jacob, yeah, all the brothers, all the tribes, were in peace, and this must be our north, to be in peace, in understanding, because both of us have a mission to help each the other in the building of a better real, human reality. Thank you. Your it's Excellency. good to start this in the same moment, because uh, one can say that you can choose your friends, but never your brothers. So. <laughs> Uh, I want to say two things. Uh, the first one is the context. Because uh, 
Sometimes we forget uh, when uh, the phrase was used. No? When the Pope uh, visited the synagogue in Rome for the first time, John Paul. And, um, but it was not the first Pope to visit the synagogue in Rome. Uh, there were Popes who used to go there to humiliate the Jews. And the community with Rabbi had to come out and to greet the Pope, give him, uh, offer him the Torah. And he was uh, giving it back, saying, you read, but you do not understand. So when after such a meetings, there is a Pope coming to the synagogue saying, you are our uh, uh, elder brothers. It's completely different uh, feeling and um, meeting. So this is the first thing I want to say and to stress that this is a the reversal of history and the reversal of science. So it, I think it works quite hard and uh, powerful. <clears throat> and um, the second thing, I think that, the, the, that our understanding of, bro of our brotherhood depends on, on our understanding of God. We both understand God as, uh, as our Father. The image of God in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament is our Father. God doesn't just uh, behave as Father. He is Father. It's a completely different idea. Okay. To behave as a Father means to give somebody food or drink or cloth or uh, happiness. But to be the Father means to share his life, to give life. And um, this is what we read in Genesis, the beginning, the first and till the third chapter, that God has created us in his picture and image. And I don't know, but especially the Orthodox Church is very careful reading the passage, picture and image. Because picture is something... Um, without any movement, is something static. You, you are a picture of God in, in, in your inner life. But image is something dynamic. So, what does it mean, dynamic? That you become like God more and more and more and more. And the only way to do it is to, to accept his life coming to you. A gift of his life coming to you. So, this is the source of our brotherhood. Uh, I am created as the image and picture of God. And Rabbi is created as the image and picture of God. And I am not created as his image and picture. <laughs> and he is not created as my picture and image. But we are both created in the picture and image of God, our Father. And he shares his life with us. So the brotherhood is very, very deep and real in God. But we need to, to talk about God not as a theory, not as a name, not as a word, abstract, but a living person. And with experience of him being living and dynamic, and that changes everything. Following this, I would like to ask you how a Christian, um, what Christian think, uh, thinking about the people of Israel, and what Jewish think about people of Israel. It is the same definition. How? What? What can you tell about it? So, what does it mean for you, people of Israel, and what it uh, means for Christians? You first. <laughs> All the brother. All the brother. Historical order. 
I know that um, for a Christian, the name Israel is understood uh, as the Christians are the new, the new people of Israel. For us, the name Israel uh, is something special. Why? What means to be a Jew? What means to be a Israel, part of the people of Israel? Uh, we exist before the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, we, in our Jewish structure, we don't make a difference between religion, people, nationality, as it was in Rome, for instance. You know that from the from the for the New Testament is. Uh, for us to be a Jew, or to be part of the people of Israel, means uh, to be at the same time part of a people, part of a religion, to have the, this religion, and uh, to be also, to have a state. The Jewish state, Israel, the state of Israel, the idea of the state of Israel, it's very difficult but, uh, uh, to speak about that because it's a, a very difficult theme because Israel must be a democratic uh, state and so on and so on. But uh, the idea of the creation of the state of Israel was to establish a Jewish state in the historical Jewish place is to be a Jew means to belong to a people, to have the same faith, and when you go to Israel, okay, and a, a Muslim will be a sit can have the citizenship of Israel, and he is an Israeli he has the citizenship of Israeli, but. Uh, for a Jew, it is a whole package. You cannot be a Jew or part of the people of Israel being a Christian. You can have Israeli nationality. You can be a citizen of Israel and have a passport in which appears a religion, Christian. And you have all the rights as a each one of the citizens in Israel. But to be a Jew, historically, I will tell you a story. In the 60s, appeared a person uh, who saved a lot of Jews during the Second World War. A, um, a Jew uh, who dressed uh, the uniform of SAS and he had talks with a, a, a group of people, convoys, with uh, with uh, with Jews, and he killed the the German soldiers uh, of the of the convoy, and he saved a lot. Were well, uh, very well established that he saved a lot of Jews. Uh, when he arrived Israel, ah, and after the world, he was a Jew, and after the world, uh, he uh, he decided to be a, a a Catholic and a priest. And he became a priest. When he arrived to Israel, he said, give me, uh, please, uh, immediately, because there is a law that each Jew who comes to Israel has the right to receive immediately the, the, um, the Israeli citizenship. And you are not a Jew, okay, uh, because that, this is a, the Jewish state. There is a whole procedure in order to have, uh, to have the citizenship. So the people remained astonished, and this this uh, case reached the Supreme Court of Israel, and from uh, three judges, two decided it's impossible to consider him. He is our brother. We love him. We recognize everything 
that they did. But from an historical point of view, he's not totally part of the Jewish people. Why? Because the definition to be a Jew, eh, we, we can find this definition in the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, when Ruth says to Naomi, where you, your God is going to be my God. Remember? And your people is going to be my people. And when you are going to be buried, there it will be also the place where I am going to be buried. It's no, in Jewish, uh, in Jewish conception, to be a Jew means not merely a nationality. No? Not only to say, I belong, I have, uh, I have Jewish roots. You must have also the Jewish identity. It's a whole. It's, it's a package. Now, I understand the, the, the Christian position. Because the Christian says, okay, was a change, occurred something. I'm, I'm going into, into your field, but let me say what I, how I see Christianity. Uh, and they consider themselves uh, Israel. And that's good. That, that's good because you, you took the Jewish values and you say, you said, okay, let us go ahead, let us universalize the Jewish values because this is what Christianity did. Christianity universalized Jewish values. At the beginning, the first Christians were Jews. And the, the first Christians really, Christianity was a inter, intra, intra, inner Jewish question. Afterwards came many, for several reasons, came many people who were not Jewish and adopted this new faith. And they spread this faith uh, in the, uh, in Europe, especially, this was the beginning, and they spread uh, many of Jewish values, um, of, of Jewish aspects of the Jewish faith, and they considered themselves, okay, maybe that we must continue Jewish history taking into account that the center of Jewish history, the Beit HaMikdash, the, the holy, Mikdash, the 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 the, 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 the temple, the holy temple in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, was destroyed by Titus in 70 A.D. Is was a, 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 a was a historical, very deep movement a, of people that considered that Jewishness that Israel is very important, and that the idea of Israel must be spread in the world, and with this I finish, in accordance to Maimonides, the, the famous Rambam, Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maimon, Spain, uh, 12th century, uh, this is the plan of God, that the Islam and Christianity are going to pave together with us, the way for the Messiah. Okay, you and us are waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah for us, for, for, uh, for first, uh, it's another Messiah, but you are waiting for the Messiah, Parousia, and we are waiting for the Messiah. In other words, we are waiting, we are waiting and working for a better world. Your Excellency, so how it is in Christianity? The best answer is a mystery. <laughs> there is no simple answer. <clears throat> uh, Rabbi said that uh, we are a new Israel. It doesn't mean that the first one stopped to exist. 
yeah. continues existing yeah. parallelly to you. Yeah. The, the problem on our side is, and uh, I can easily understand what you said, but the problem on our side is that nearly through 20 centuries, we used to speak about uh, being new Israel in a, in a way of replacement. Okay, Jews used to be the people of God, but they are no longer the people of God. There is, now there is a new covenant in Christ Jesus, so the old one is abolished. And uh, uh, there's a question, what is the place for Israel in history? Yeah? If, the, if the old, test, old uh, covenant is abolished, uh, we replaced Israel. Yeah. We used to speak in such a way since second century, I'm afraid, till uh, nearly Nostra Etate. So we stopped to speak in such a way 50 years ago. And we come back now to, to the ideas of the Bible and to the letters of St. Paul. And Paul, in a letter of, uh, in the letter to Romans, chapter 11, probably this is the most important passage now when we speak in is about Israel. Paul says that uh, um, God doesn't stop, that doesn't change his election and his choice. So if he chooses somebody, his choice is forever. God doesn't, uh, how to say it, yeah. sorry for my English. Uh, God doesn't uh, revoke his uh, choosing yeah, and his calling. And his calling lasts forever. So Israel is Israel and is uh, chosen people of God. This is what Pope says in uh, Romans 11. And there is a picture of the olive tree probably the most famous picture by Paul speaking about the relationship between church and Israel. So there is a root, which is people of God, Israel. Israel is a root and the root becomes a tree. And then uh, uh, in a moment of a time, God implants some rams to the same tree the tree is still the same tree so it's not uh, a picture of cutting the tree and planting the new one no it's still the same tree and the tree is a living living organism so we are implanted we are we as a church we are implanted so they they even when we say new Israel, it doesn't mean that the, the first one is not important. And so now is the place for mystery, because what is the connection between Israel and, and, a, and a new Israel? We say we are one, we are united, but in a way which doesn't change each of us. Yeah? So we still are the same. We are Christians, you are Jews, but we are united. Uh, so this is the answer for new Israel. Yeah? But there is something more important, I think, when we speak about people of Israel and people of God. That means the way God reveals himself in the world. That his revelation goes through the community, through the people. Of course, both of, us, both of us, we read Bible. But Bible is written in the context of the people of God. First, we had a faith coming from, from mouth to mouth, from, from person to person, from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob, and so on. So God called the people, not the writers. The writers at the end. 
Sometimes I say that God used to write, to write, to write the books at the end. You know? but first, there is a proclamation, and there is a living faith in the, in the people of God. And uh, that's why God is also a hero of our history. Those people you know, raises in history, grows in history, goes through the history. Um, so there are quite a few important uh, matters in the, in, the, in, the, in the figure of people of God. Okay, you said that really the God tells us and explains us the, the things. So I would like to ask you what God tells us in this uh, Tower of Babel. Uh, one month ago, it was the day of Judaism here in Łódź, and Your Excellency, you organized it, and it was the reflections on the Tower of Babel. So what this story uh, tells to Jews and to Christians? How do you explain it? Maybe God doesn't want to, to, to follow the dialogue because he mixed us languages. Because he mixed languages. There are several uh, explanations about uh, the story of the Tower of Babel. Um, the simple explanation is that uh, the people of uh, Babel, I use the, the Hebrew, the Hebrew pronunciation of the word. It's is also Polish, Babel. Babel. It's Polish. Yeah, close to Hebrew. Sounds Polish. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds Polish. Is, um, uh, is, is simple. They develop technology, a new technology for that time, because we have a, a a description that uh, how they improve uh, the production of bricks and uh, of construction. So they felt that they are uh, very important and uh, powerful. And so they challenged God. They said, okay, uh, we can, something very similar to what is going on in our days. Uh, Human being uh, feels we develop at such a degree science and technology that we are almost like God. And I would say that there are many people that consider themselves uh, that they have the power, God's powers. So they decided to uh, to build up a, um, a tower defying. Uh, uh, challenging heaven, uh, heaven. Okay, um, this is one explanation. Second explanation could be this: at the beginning of the story appears the idea that uh, all the people in Babel had only one language, and that. Having only one language, the, the text says this empowered them to take a decision and to build this tower. What was God's punishment to the people there? He confused the languages. But don't forget that uh, in the uh, biblical conception, God punished a so as a saying in the Talmud, uh, uh, breaking the elements, the same the elements which conduct the people to commit the error, to commit the transgression. Is some uh, exegeta, some uh, interpreter, very great interpreter of of the Torah, of the of, of the Humash, of the Bible? Uh, at the beginning of the Renaissance, said this question, asked himself this question. How is it possible that there is only one language? Even here, all of you are speaking Polish, but there are uh, nonsense, um, nonsense, yeah, in the language. 
uh, you can uh, in, uh, this, uh, make an interpretation of a word in some way with such color, and another one can interpret the word in another, in another sense. It's the same word, but must be a possibility of interpretations only when you are living in a reality of a dictator, in a reality in which there is only one language permitted, the language of the dictator, of the tyrant, only in this reality he can impose a one language and uh, because that all the idea was uh, totally uh, an idea, a nonsense idea to build something in order to demonstrate how great we are. Now, the last explanation from a Midrash from the Middle Ages. Uh, what was so bad? The Midrash says that when uh, they were in the middle of the construction and one of the workers fall and, <laughs> and died is the, the organizer said, oh God, what occurred here? Oh, oy vai. One oy vai, this is from Yiddish, oy vai, is we lost, we lost the worker. Excuse me. When one break fall and destroy, they said, oy vai. We lost a break when one uh, when one woman uh, fought and and killed. They said nothing. It was clear. I, I confused in the. I, uh, I didn't tell exactly the story. The story is when one break fall and was destroyed. It was a terrible pain for them when one uh, human being fall and it was killed, it was nothing for them. They were indifferent. They gave more importance to the bricks than to human beings' life. Uh, the Pope Francis told me that when we analyzed this together, uh, really uh, he, um, uh, he took this explanation. He, he um, uh, this uh, this midrash was very important for him. He he enjoyed a lot this with this explanation, and in certain opportunity uh, he told me, you know what, uh, I quoted your midrash and I said from a Jew I learned that the explanation of the Tower of Babel is so and so and so. Father. Uh, you are already a third rabbi I listened to in the last one month, I think, uh, uh, explaining the Tower of Babel. And in, uh, all of you in the same way, meaning that uh, um, there was nothing positive in one language. And uh, the, the, the people agree. were forced to speak one language. And uh, what is... Uh, Wonderful for me is exactly the experience of Francis that we want to listen to your explanation for each for for itself. So uh, this is what Pope Benedict the Sixteenth taught us to do: and just first listen to the Jews explaining the Hebrew Bible, and this is important. How Israel today gives an explanation to his own text. Yeah? And um, so it's always a privilege to listen to Rabbi uh, uh, explaining the, the Hebrew Bible. It always helps us because sometimes I think that we do not uh, ask the same questions to, to the same text. But of course, there is an explanation which is um, privilege in the church uh, and uh, it's privilege because it goes together with the book of the Acts of the Apostles the, the chapter 2nd the Pentecost event 
And um, what is the connection that, uh, to say it briefly, the Tower of Babel, you have uh, uh, one nation and the people who are, in a sense, uh, very pious people, because what they build is in fact a temple. They follow the pattern of, uh, of the, the temples of Babylon. Yeah? But, so they, they build a huge, huge tower, on a, but on, on the top there will be a temple. So they are very pious. But they uh, behave exactly opposite to what they were told to do by God, because God told them, go, go to the world and fill the world and uh, give birth to your children. And so we fill the world with your presence. Uh, they said, no, no, we stay and we build a sign for us not to be dispersed. And so they do not obey God and they build a temple. And in fact, they say, we will build a monument for us. This is what the, the Hebrew text says exactly. Yeah? We will build a monument for us. So they build a temple, but the temple will be a monument for them, not to God, to them. It sounds very familiar. Anyway, because it can happen everywhere, everywhere and each time. So uh, the Pentecost event is exactly opposite. So because the apostles go out of the, uh, from the room uh, and they say, and they proclaim the glory of God. They, they speak about great works of God, great deeds of God. So they proclaim the glory of God. They build a monument to God, not to themselves. And this is exactly what makes them one. Because when they wanted to, to be the monument for themselves, they were dispersed. This is how the pride operates. Yeah? You want to be somebody, and uh, this is the beginning of the, of the division. Yeah? And when you proclaim the glory of God, you come together to one body. So uh, probably because of that uh, unity of two passages of the Bible, we uh, especially, we, we, we take a special in, uh, um, importance to, to that explanation. But I am really grateful for what you said about Tower of Babel. Thank you. It is wonderful to make a dialogue between people who uh, like to listen to each other and to share and to learn from each other. Uh, but um, so it is much easier to speak about similarities. But let's talk also about differences. And um, I must ask these questions. Um, so how Jews interpret who was Jesus? Who was Jesus? How Jews interpret it? We interpreted Jesus as, in the same way, as in the Gospels, a, um, his fellows called Jesus, Rabbi. He was a master. He was a master. Uh, you know, many of his teachings or mm, views of the interpretation of the Torah uh, have um, a parallel in the rabbis, in other rabbis of his time, in, uh, in Hillel, for instance, or rabbis after his time. He was a master, a rabbi, a teacher in, in his time, very spiritual, very special, um that is it um this is uh, this is the jewish view of uh, jesus two things i i would like to add uh, one regarding what you said in your answer that uh, 
since Benedictus, um, you that he as Pope said, it's very interesting uh, to hear the explanations of the rabbis. This idea was written in Evangelium Gaudi um, in an explicit way by Pope Francis at the end of the chapter in which he analyzes the relationship with the Jews. Um, uh, the second point is, um, yes, about the description that the Benedictus uh, gives about who was Jesus in the first chapter of his book, Jesus of Nazareth, which is not doctrine, the doctrinal book, and the description is uh, it's very interesting. It's in accordance also to verses in the, in the New Testament uh, in which he compares Jesus to Moses. Um, okay, for us, it, it's not so. Uh, he says that uh, Jesus is, it's, it's very interesting theologically for you, must be very interesting because uh, he's a human being. Moses was very human for us. And for us, God is one and this, the, the, the idea of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Son, uh, it's not. We don't accept that, of course. But it, the, the way that Ratzinger presented the image of, of uh, Jesus as uh, some creature in, in the middle between God, uh, uh, he compares with Moses. Uh, so, uh, he, in accordance to my understanding of what he tries to say, is that he was a human being with a, with a special spirit. Um, of course, with a special spirit. A human being. We make a great difference. A human being is forever a human being. And this is the difference between, between us and the Christian vision. Your Excellency, I know that um, probably most of the public are, are Christians, but uh, the same question. So who is the Jesus for Christians? Well, I will start, start from the title Rabbi. Because it is true that he is first called Rabbi. Um, if you take uh, fifth chapter of Luke, it's a beautiful moment when Christ Jesus meets uh, Simon Peter for the first time. And uh, he says to him, uh, go into the boat and let us uh, swim to the center of the lake and throw your net to catch the fish. But, and uh, Simon says, Rabbi, we have worked the whole night and we caught nothing. But because of your word, I will obey you. So this is still the moment when uh, Jesus is a rabbi for Simon Peter. But then, Peter sees uh, hundreds of fish in his boat. And he has to kneel down before Jesus. And he says, in Greek is, Kyrie, Lord, go away because I am a sinner. So this is the first moment when Peter has no longer call him rabbi, he calls him Kyrios. And, um, and of course you know that in a Septuagint, Kyrios is the word replacing the name of God. This is the proclamation of the gospel. And then again, uh, that is in Matthew, and when they are on the, on the same lake the next time, and uh, 
And you know the story that Peter tried to walk on the water and he started to uh, to, uh, to die. So, and he said, save me. So the rabbi becomes Lord and Savior. That's our way we, we see Jesus. And this is a huge change from rabbi to Kyrios and to Savior. <clears throat> and the, the second thing I want to say is, uh, you said that probably the, the majority of the congregation is Christian, so probably you had a chance to be uh, at the Mass today and listen to the Gospel. Um, uh, today's Gospel uh, was speaking about uh, Mont Tabor. Uh, Jesus took Peter, John, and James. And uh, the Gospel says that the cloud, the sign of God from Hebrew Bible, from uh, uh, Exodus, the, the cloud came and uh, and from the cloud, there was a voice coming. He is my beloved son. Listen to him. And um, the voice came to the, to, to the three people who used to listen to Moses and to Elijah. Those, those two people, the two persons, yeah, we, we believe that's in the gospel that Moses and Elijah they came to Jesus on Mount Tabor. And Peter, James, and John sold them, three of them, walking and talking. So the voice comes and says, listen to him. They used to listen to Moses, and they, to use, and they used to listen to Elijah, to, to the law and to the prophets. And uh, the voice says, listen to him. And again, doesn't mean... Stop listening to Moses and do not listen to Elijah. So, so forget the law and forget the prophets. But the voice says, this is how we explain the, the passage. Yeah? If you want to obey Moses, look how Jesus explains the, the law. And if you want to be open for all the promises given by prophets. Welcome Jesus in your life and, and all the promises will be fulfilled in your life. Yeah? The promises given by the prophets, the promise of peace, the promise of happiness, the promise of salvation, they come to you and they become word incarnated in your life yeah? when you accept Jesus. So, uh, this is what, what I said uh, already be, during the interview in the media room, that we cannot understand us without you. You probably can understand yourself without us, but we cannot understand us without you. We, we do not understand Jesus without Moses and Elijah. That's true. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I would totally like to true. <laughs> I want to ask you one more difficult question. So, uh, what are the it most? It wasn't difficult. It was not okay. So I will, I will be more difficult. <laughs> so, what are the most difficult uh, problems, uh, clashes between uh, Jews and Christians? to solve in the dialogue? What, uh, what is the, the points you discuss the most? What are the problems you don't solve? My question is about differences, the biggest uh, um, clashes. Could be different. We have to separate two things. Never we are going to agree theologically. Why? Because from that time, to the time of the gospel of, uh, of Jesus, of Jesus, not of the gospels, of Jesus, where Jews 
that accepted Jesus and were Jews that didn't. Uh, when you speak about the, the miracles performed by Jesus, okay, I can bring examples from the Talbot regarding miracles in the same way that uh, were performed by, by rabbis. This is not the essence of, this must not and could not be, nevermore, the essence of our, of our talking, of our dialogue. When we speak about, at, at certain opportunity, I asked uh, my, my very good friend uh, uh, in Rome, tell me, what should be the next step in, in our dialogue? He said, a theological one. Theological one. Yeah, afterwards, I asked uh, from him a uh, bibliography, and I gave me, uh, I, I, I told him, give me bibliography, and okay, he quoted two books. Uh, interesting. One written by an uh, Argentinian uh, person who uh, devotes years and years of study. Uh, and uh, he developed some very interesting theories in the two, the two truths that uh, uh, have to complement one the other. And the other is a book, La Promise, from Lustiger. Lustiger, a Jew who ended his life being a Archbishop Emeritus of Paris, Aaron Lustiger. Okay. Is um, so when we speak about theology, the thing we must speak about this is how, with the great humility, I understand is how one can be the complement of the other. There are two truths. I go back to Nostra Etate, to Nostra Etate. Uh, the, First covenant was not revoked, and this is the English version of Nostra Etate, was not revoked, not, he doesn't, the, the text doesn't say is, uh, uh, is not abolished, is not revoked, this is a stronger word. Is, this is um, uh, the way I see that the dialogue must continue. Uh, to see, how one uh, really can help the other. And each one has to continue in his uh, own way, in his own identity, has uh, Pope Francis stressed that emphatically in, 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 a lot, in, in a lot of opportunities. The idea of our dialogue is not more as it was in the Middle Ages and after the Middle Ages to convince one the other. We remember disputes in the Middle Ages. Disputes, no. This, no. This, not more. What we must do from now onwards is to dialogue, to understand one the other uh, with the hope that through this dia dialogue, the Jew can be a better Jew, and the Christian who is involved in this dialogue can improve his Christianity. You said this a, a few minutes ago. It's impossible for me to understand my Christianity without knowing what a Jew means. The, the idea is not who has the truth. You have your vision, I have my vision, but there are a lot of points in common. We can share, we must share a lot of points. Really, I had problems in dialogue with the, with the persons with whom I develop a real deep dialogue because the other one uh, never tried to convince me okay I have the truth no 
he explained me. I believe in this because this and this and this. And I and he tried to be empathic with me, trying to understand. Okay, why do you believe what you are believing? What, what is your tradition? And not only, uh, as I said before, our relationship is a very special, is a brotherhood and quotation signs relationship. So we are very close each to the other, as it's the official uh, policy of the Vatican. We have, I quote now what Cardinal Koch used to say at any opportunity, we are very related, uh, we are related, we maintain a dialogue with all the cults, with all the religions, but in a special way with the Jews. He quoted him verbatim. Yeah? And this is the official, the official point of the Catholic Apostolic Church. And that's true. And that's true. We are very close in many senses. Very, very close. The same cradle. The same. And the, we ma the challenge is to go ahead in this dialogue um, to, to fortify the dialogue and to build new patterns which uh, will give us the possibility, as I said before, uh, to give to humankind uh, the real message that I believe God is expecting from us. Well, to be honest, I also think that the problem is not theological. Uh, I remember what uh, once Rabbi Greenberg told to me. There's, uh, you know, Irving Greenberg. Yeah? Greenberg told me that uh, both uh, uh, Judaism and Christianity they share the same message and way. The message is messianic, and the way is covenantal. It's a wonderful phrase. The, the message is messianic and the way is covenantal. And uh, so there are two pillars our faith, faith is based on. So, and uh, if you read the modern theology in, in, in the Catholic Church, you will find that the, the words by, by Cardinal Koch being common. We do not place any more a dialogue with Jews in, in, a, in, a, in a place of interreligious dialogue. Our dialogue with Jews is not interreligious. Interreligious dialogue is with Muslims, with Buddhists, but not with Judaism. No, never. And, uh, and you will find many, many theological books saying that Israel will be saved by parousia. So this is our expectation of Messiah. We, ex we wait for him and you wait for him. Anyway, so the, the, the problem is not theological. Uh, the problem is, because you ask about what is difficult, not what is easy. Yeah? What is difficult is uh, having the understanding of dialogue. Because for many of us, the main idea of dialogue is to get the truth. We need to know the truth. But uh, the dialogue, in fact, is a matter of building the relationship. This is what I know from the Jews. <laughs> yeah. there are some Polish Jews told me that. And, uh, all the examples of dialogue in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, the dialogues between God and man. What are they for? When God starts dialogue with uh, Adam, where are you? Well, he knows where he is. Why does he ask? For the, 
the in order to of Russia, in order to enter with him in, yeah. in words and dialogue. It's, it's not the truth, you know, which what is important in a dialogue, in, in that dialogue, because no, God knows the truth. Why? Excuse me, the same occurred after uh, Cain. Cain and Abel. Cain, Cain, exactly uh, where, where is yeah. your brother? God knew where the brother yeah. is. What's the simple explanation of the Midrash quoted by Rashi? Rashi is a very exegete of the Bible. Is in order to enter with him in the dialogue, okay. yeah, not to abandon him. If he doesn't ask the question, Adam and Cain, they will never start. Because they, they did something wrong. Now they hide themselves. They don't want to talk to God. So he is the one to start the relationship, to start the relationship from the beginning, again and again and again. That's why he enters the dialogue. Well, not to discover the truth because he knows the truth, yeah, but he builds the relationship. And, um, well, okay, we know it. The problem is that we, uh, we are in such a dialogue only 50 years. After nearly 2,000 of difficult history and uh, it's not so easy to uh, to change the <laughs> the matters in 50 years and so this is an obstacle uh, that uh, uh, such a dialogue is a still a very very young tree between us and, uh, but we are patient <laughs> yeah. the, the most important the most important is never, never ever to forget that this must be the path, that this must be the way. Um, let me let me add one word. Then I will add one word. <laughs> when you, uh, when the Pope was here, uh, before coming to Poland to to, to visit or to be to, to be in Auschwitz and Birkenau. He told me, I would like you be present uh, when I'm going to be in, in Auschwitz and Birkenau. Uh, so after uh, when we went out from from uh, from Birkenau, is a Polish journalist asked me uh, about the importance of dialogue. And I uh, my answer that came from the deep of my heart was take a look over this these buildings the buildings the bar barracks in in Birkenau would be a dialogue this barracks would not have a presence in this place you use a power destruction um, you kill when the word and the power of the word disappears and this is the way the importance is to stress that from now and forever to dialogue you know for us jews emet um, the truth is in the hands of God. We cannot reach the truth. So when we begin a dialogue, we must, as you said, as you said, God knew the truth. But by the dialogue, he didn't abandon not Adam, neither Cain, neither the assassin, neither the assassin. This is the power of dialogue, the power of words. When words disappear, is it's terrible. The all the lack of words is violence. This is the way of violence, the for violence. Well, this is exactly the the, the, the sentence I wanted to add, because um, when I speak about the dialogue, it doesn't mean that the truth is not important. The truth is important, but uh, it's not the same as um, thinking about yourself uh, that the truth is your possession. 
And I, I remember my professor, you will like, like it, my professor of history. He came once to, to our classroom and uh, he started to read a text. And uh, the text uh, went in such a way, I quote from, uh, from, from the heart, so uh, the, the text was such a way. This is a temptation coming back again and again also to Christians to think about themselves as the possessors of truth. And the professor asked us, what do you think about the sentence? It's true or wrong? Is it true or it is a heresy? And, uh, you know, we are already in, on our second year of studies, so we are very young. So we said, well, this is wrong. There's something wrong in the sentence. And he said, okay, now let us look about the signature. And the signature was John Paul II. Yeah. His um, message for the Day of Peace in 1983. So to seek the truth is not the same as thinking about yourself as a possessor of truth. It, and it, it goes with your faith, my faith, that the whole truth is given to us through Christ. Yeah? That the whole truth is given to me by Christ. It doesn't mean that I possess the truth and that I know it yeah, in every single piece. Yeah? So this is what I wanted to add, yeah. You both said that uh, dialogue is a path to receive a real brotherhood or relationship. How to talk or how to uh, create the dialogue uh, with uh, that part of uh, Christians or um, Jews who doesn't want to go into dialogue? What to do with it? How to go to, to the people who are afraid of dialogue, who doesn't uh, see the future of a dialogue. Is it really the um, brotherhood between Jews and uh, uh, Christian possible? They don't believe in it. So how to work on it in church, uh, in synagogue? How to work on it? I have a temptation to start. What? I have a temptation to okay. start. This is what Francis used to say, uh, Pope Francis. Uh, this is the attraction of witnessing. You cannot force somebody to dialogue. Yeah? But what are we doing now is, uh, I hope that this is a testimony and I hope it is attractive. So if it is attractive, there will be some to follow us. So witnessing is attractive, and there is no way to force somebody to dialogue. That's all for myself. That's true, and, but the, the real problem is not just how to inspire people uh, for dialogue. Only people in the dialogue, in the Jewish uh, Christian dialogue. The real question is how to inspire people to dialogue at all, in general. The, are we real, really dialogical creatures? Are we prepared to hear the other? Really a man, each one man is prepared to hear we are really the voice of his spouse, of his wife. Are parents real prepared to hear the voice of their children? This is the first question. And the second the point is I agree totally with you. We must be paradigms. This is what I, I did with uh, with Bergoglio when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires. This was his intention. 31 programs we recorded for the television, for a special channel 
archbishop in uh, in Buenos Aires. What was the first idea? This this was my felt in uh, my feeling. Excuse me, my feeling uh, when uh, when I uh, when we recorded the programs that the programs are not devoted exactly specific specifically for uh, for the interreligious dialogue the program was a an example that how two persons from two different traditions which clashed in the past are ready to sit around the table to analyze burning themes with an open heart and even joking uh, one with the other is uh, for a society, for the Argentinian society, in which dialogue is a, is a subject which must be developed more and more. Uh, in Argentina, we have a great problem of dialogue. Uh, and this Poland, is the point. we have to. No, no, I'm uh, quite happy. Okay. <laughs> um, I have now a uh, not political correct question to your rabbi. Uh, because you are in a very special position, you are a friend of the uh, head of the uh, Catholic Church, you are a friend of San Fra Francis. And uh, you got the honorary um, doctorate of a Catholic university. You are invited for many Christians or Catholic uh, events. I want to ask you how uh, Jewish people from your community or in Argentina or your Jewish friends react on it. <laughs> I received all kinds of reactions from uh, different, for different people, but two rabbis, one a very important rabbi in Israel. Uh, when I was accompanying uh, Pope Francis in his uh, pilgrimage to Israel, to the, to the Holy Land, uh, which means uh, Palestine, Jordan, Israel, is when I talk uh, with him, he said, um, you are doing a holy thing uh, in your life. What you are doing is something holy, something very, very important. And uh, I received this reaction as a, this commentary, as um, a commentary from a very, from a sage, because he is part, there is a committee in the Central Rabbinate of Israel uh, named uh, the Sages of the Torah. He is one of them. And this for me was a, a very inspiring uh, commentary, a very, a very important commentary because it uh, came from a, from a person, from a very, a person full with Torah, with knowledge, with a, uh, with spirituality and he saw what i'm doing with the pope uh, what and, uh, uh, first of all with the archbishop then with the pope as uh, something very important something holy something uh, blessed by god and this i i take his words as an answer and many jews are considering very well, uh, uh, are applauding, to say something, uh, our work, our work. Father, would you like to tell us something about the same situation? You also, you're working in the dialogue, how you are received here between, in church, as a person of interfaith and ecumenic dialogue? 
I have no such a problem because I know that I follow the main stream of the Catholic teaching. So, okay, sometimes I think that we do not follow our own teaching, not only in the field of uh, ecumenism or dialogue, Jewish Christian dialogue. There are many fields we do not follow our own teaching, but this is our common fault. What I want to do is to follow the teaching of my church. I believe it's inspired by Holy Spirit, and I cannot do something different. We, uh, I remember that we, uh, that was, a, was six years ago, I think. Uh, it will show you that I, I also sometimes do, I, I also don't obey the teaching of my church sometimes, yeah, because I don't know it. We it, it tried to prepare something what was called Assisi in Krakow. Yeah, the meeting, interreligious and um, meeting of prayer and uh, doing something good in Krakow. It was a wonderful rabbi in Krakow, and he was uh, also a he was deeply involved in doing that. And uh, we came to the moment when he said, okay, we can pray together. And I said, no. I said, no. My fault, my fault, my fault. And I think half a year later, uh, <laughs> I opened the teaching of uh, one of the Vatican congregation when it is, you know, black on white that we are all encouraged to pray together with Jews. So it was my fault. I didn't know the teaching of my own church. That's why in, I behaved in a stupid way. Rabbi was open and he was ready to pray together. And I was afraid. Can I do it? Eh? Now I know we can pray together. <laughs> um, and I, I am um, quite happy because I know I will obey the real teaching of my church. So all those different opinions, to be honest, doesn't matter. Mm, I have a very intimate question. What do you feel when you pray together, Jews and Christian, in front of in Auschwitz? Because you did both. The challenge that I feel as a person, a descendant from two families, from my father's side and from my mother's side, that they lost m a lot of members in, in Auschwitz or the other concentration camps is what I feel deeply. And maybe that this was the what inspires me at the end, at last, to be a rabbi. Because my first intention was to be a chemist. I have a PhD in chemistry. And I said, okay, meanwhile, I'll continue studying in order to know, just to know. This fulfilled a great part of my thirst of knowledge eh, to study Talmud and, and to continue. And I finished and I got a, a title, a, a rabbinical smicha, rabbinical title, but God had other uh, plans for me. And at the end, eh, I devoted my life to rabbinics. And, but when I think, when I analyze why it was, it occurred in this way in my life, occurred this in my life, the only answer that I can find is because I have the passion to make a turning point in history that Auschwitz and Treblinka and Helm no, no more. 
no more, no more, no for Jews, and no more for no other human being. And we have to pray together. We, we have to stay all Jews, Christians, agnostics, atheists, in some spiritual, we call that to pray together, but in some spirit, spiritual uh, standing with a spiritual commitment. You no, know, we are not beasts. We are not worse than beasts. We are human beings. We must produce a turning point in history. And the only key we have to begin this turning point is dialogue. This is my passion. And because that, what means to, uh, to pray together? We can pray a lot together. How? Saying Psalms. Psalms is a, a whole scripture for Christian and for Jews. Saying Pater Noster in Latin or Avinu Shebashamayim in Hebrew. It's exactly the same. Avinu Shebashamayim, our Father in heaven. In heaven. Is uh, because, as you said at the beginning, we have a transcendental, we believe in a transcendental Father who is with us, among us. Uh, this is what we are sharing, this belief, this faith we are sharing. And because that is important, uh, to pray together or even to prepare some special moments for all human beings. Your Excellency. There are a few moments in my life that I they were special when I think about the common prayer with Jews. The most important moment for me was uh, four years ago, I think. There was a concert at the gate of uh, Birkenau. And the concert was uh, called The Sacrifice of Innocence. And I think there were 10,000 people being present. And among them, there were 50 bishops, half of the number from Poland and uh, half from the world, from Austria, from Germany. Uh, and there were 50 rabbis from all over the world. And there was a moment we stood up and we sang Shema Israel together. I will never forget it. The most important uh, commandment. So the word coming from God and coming back to God because we pray. Well, you know the, the passage from Isaiah. Isaiah says that my word do not come back to me without doing what it is uh, sent for. So the word of God is powerful. God can create things by his word. So his word doesn't come back to him without doing without doing, but that uh, Shema Israel, I think we were all also uh, certain that we sing instead of those people who were killed there. But they need to have a voice today. And that uh, we could give them a voice for the moment and they could sing Shema through our lips was, uh, uh, but uh, the experience of community, incredible, completely incredible. Uh, 50 bishops, 50 rabbis, and 10,000 people surrounding us, and we are singing Shema Israel. 
I will never forget it. Thank you very much. We had here the experience, probably part of the people who are here uh, in 2004. It was sixth anniversary of the liquidation of the Litzmannstadt ghetto. And it was the concert on the old market. And Joseph Malovane was singing Shema Israel. And in the moment when he started, it was the storm. And the sky opened, heaven opened, and it was raining. And it was incredible for most, for all the people. It was just like God say to people downstairs. But thank you very much. I have 50 more questions, but I know that probably some people have 50 more. Yeah? <laughs> so uh, please, uh, we have a possibility to ask some questions. If you have, please uh, put your hand. Proszę Państwa, pytania, jeżeli macie, tylko musimy do mikrofonu, bo będą one tłumaczone dla rabina Abrahama Skórki. Czy ktoś z Państwa chciałby zadać jakieś pytanie? To może proszę zadawać po polsku, a będzie tłumaczone dla, dla rabina. Excelencjo, rabinie, pierwszy jestem... Jestem bardzo zbudowany, kiedy widzę przedstawicieli, jak to było wspomniane, tych, którzy są naszymi ojcami wierzy i tych, którzy są dziećmi, rozmawiający ze sobą w takiej pokorze. To nierzadko, nieczęsto się zdarza. A moje pytanie do rabina, cieszę się, że mam taką okazję zadać. Trudno byłoby pojechać do Argentyny, żeby to pytanie zadać. Rabin przyjechał tutaj do nas, to wielki przywilej. A rozumiem, że wspólnota żydowska ma problem z akceptowaniem Jezusa jako Syna Bożego ze względu na fakt, że ten człowiek nie powinien nazywać siebie ani uważać siebie za Syna Bożego. Natomiast jestem bardzo ciekaw z punktu widzenia wspólnoty żydowskiej, co brakuje Jezusowi, żeby był w oczach w rozumieniu żydowskim Mesjaszem. Jeśli można byłoby spróbować odpowiedzieć na to pytanie, byłoby to bardzo budujące. Może trwa chwileczkę tłumaczenie. It's not an easy question. It's not, no, no, no. It's not an easy question. Um, uh, in accordance to Maimonides, when the Messiah, we are going to know that certain person is the Messiah, is if uh, the people of Israel will live in peace in the earth of Israel, and if it will be peace around the world, and will come a, a person who is, a, by the way, the Messiah, in accordance to, to Maimonides, to our belief, is not the son of God. Is, is like uh, one of us, a person, and he is a descendant from uh, from David, as appears in the Gospels regarding Jesus, and uh, he can he has certain uh, special uh, capabilities uh, to judge persons exactly who is guilty and who is innocent and all kind of things this way we can learn from uh, chapter 11 in Isaiah is uh, if this uh, it's going to be with this person we will know that this is the Messiah but I will tell you something 
when the Messiah will come, okay, this is a question, maybe a question of God. For us, a question of God. For you also. Parousia is a question of God, the decision of God. But, but what we have to do is to work for the coming of the Messiah's time. And what I believe is that God will give us his answer, will send the Messiah when we will prepare the world to receive him. This is my answer. Well, mm. Ja przygotowałem pytanie po angielsku, wobec tego może zadam, myślę, że wszyscy państwo są już przyzwyczajeni do słuchania w tym języku. So I assume that this conference... Henryku, do mikrofonu, mocno. Mm -hmm. A teraz lepiej? Bardzo dobrze. I assume that this meeting has been inspired by tensions, recent tensions between the Jews and Poles to some extent. Uh, and uh, to consider the questions which were raised here during the discussion, uh, maybe I am in some way designed to add additional questions because I am a scientist, a pioneer of molecular biology in Poland and a student of somebody who was the designer of molecular biology in the world, uh, in America. Uh, therefore, the present problems of humanity, one could uh, define as something related to unliving matter, to living matter, and to psychological matter. And in my opinion, we are dealing very well with non-living matter. We are fighting problems concerned living matter, but we are not prepared and not able to solve problems which are uh, created by psych psychological parts of living matter. And uh, therefore, uh, the problems which arise right now, they are mainly created by the fact that people concentrate on living matter, but not on psychological living matter. Uh, the attitudes, the for example, the problem of money. Money is a unit of values, material values. And uh, people concentrate on money because they uh, mainly deal with the problem of everyday needs, material needs. Uh, while what uh, Christ was teaching is mainly dealing with psychological relations between people. So there is a question. Uh, can, is it possible to ask whether everything what was stated by Christ in Bible, is that answering the today's human race problems in psychological terms? If so, then one can say that what was said by Christ, if that solves the contemporary problems of humanity, it's coming from God. And uh, that would, uh, in some way, uh, pro uh, make the, uh, answer the question whether Christ is uh, Messiah. Następne pytania, bardzo proszę troszeczkę krótsze. I 
to be honest, I have no idea what to say. Um, the, the one thing I th uh, comes to me is uh, this is not a psychology, it's something different. This is the vision of a person, human person. And there are some terms uh, in Christianity which are dedicated to solve the problems. I mean, the two most important are responsibility and uh, sin and salvation, forgiveness. And um, if we do not use such a terms, we create psychological problems. Uh, I've been once to, to the meeting of so-called Polish-Russian team for difficult task. There is such a thing. Yeah? Polish-Russian team for difficult task. I wonder if there are any easy task between Polish and Russian. Anyway, uh, the meeting was held in Moscow and um, the, the secretary of Patriarch uh, Kirill came to the meeting and he said that I don't remember exact num exact uh, number but I think feature he said 70 percent of Russian people suffer um, uh, depression and he asked why because it was forbidden in Soviet Union to speak about sin when we could when you speak about sin, some people say that this is something offending human beings yeah, and that you distress them. No, it's not true. Because when you say, in Christian way, when we speak about sin, we say there is also a Redeemer. If we are not sure that we have a Redeemer from our sin, we would stop to speak about sin. You cannot... Uh, leave a person with the idea of sin without showing him the way out. And we say, there is a sin, my sin, my responsibility, my fault, also in face of the Jews, I can say many times, my fault, my fault. But there is a forgiveness offered by God. There is a solving of the problem of evil. Not easy solving, not easy remedy. But I think that if you uh, do not uh, make a person facing such a, su those terms, sin, fault, uh, forgiveness, uh, you create psychological problems. This is my opinion. I try to understand the essence, or as the person who asked, that, ah, yeah, I try to understand the essence of the quinta essence of your question. Eh, what really was your question? If a eh, religion or belief is a part of our psychological structure and if uh, and then it is merely it is merely what can i say some uh, some utopia or some remedy what yeah some uh, some remedy for my uh, for my anxiety for my existential anxiety Look, since a uh, human being, since the, rec the first records that we have uh, about history of human of humanity in the different in the different cultures in the different places appears the the searching of spirituality 
son of God. And this is uh, for me a proof that beyond uh, the powers and explanations of psychology, we have some kind of intuition. We have, as humans, being uh, some kind of, of feelings, some kind of perceptions which bounds us uh, to God. Um, this is my answer. Uh, psychology can explain a lot of things. Yes, a lot of things. But it's not, it's not more than a science. And science, you know very well, has limits. We don't know exactly where the limits are. But as we are going further and further, we are discovering new limits. Uh, remain the story of the great professors of logic at the beginning of the 20th century when they try to build up a perfect mathematics and what occurred with the paradox of Bertrand Russell of Russell's yeah uh, of Russell's question Bertrand Russell's question and the uh, and the same even in uh, in quantum in quantum mechanics we know we know a lot but at certain moment, at, at the beginning, it's everything very, very logic. And in quantum mechanics, at certain point, and this is the, the opinion that shared with me a professor specialized in particles, uh, in elementary particles, at certain point, you don't know exactly what you are speaking about. It, it looks like a, like a mystery. And the same we can say about uh, the theory of relativity. Uh, okay, the first uh, theory uh, from 1905, okay, it's very logic, and we reach some very strange reality of four dimensions. But afterwards, with the use of tensors and of the, uh, with the general uh, theory of relativity from 19. Uh, 16th, oh, you enter in a world which is so strange and which is so far for common sense. Science uh, is a very important tool for humanity, tremendous important. But we have to remember the Tower of Babel. God put limits to our knowledge. We will go further and further. Why? Because it appears in the Psalm number eight that we are very, we are almost as God. But not God. But the chasreu meat melokim in Hebrew. That God created human being, he, 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 he created in a way that there is a, a little bit between God and human being, but there is a little bit. Thank you. But, uh, we have expression in Polish, but that almost uh, makes a difference. <laughs> um, my name is Günther Tau from Poland. I have a very short question um, uh, to two of you. Uh, I've asked uh, if you are believing in the evolutionary process of Darwin. And sec the evolutionary process of Darwin, 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 and plus uh, you were talking that it takes it was taking two thousand years that the Catholic Church or the Christian Church is coming into dialogue with the Jewish, and uh, and or that's only starting fifty years before. So um, as we are under pressure or challenges worldwide. Uh, do you think that we can speed up the evolutionary process of dialogue that maybe in 100 years there is no more a difference between Jewish and Christians?
No, the, this time the answer is simple. As a church, as a church, when we try to uh, describe our faith, we say nothing about evolution. Either no, either yes, nothing. This is the subject for science. And since uh, at least uh, Second Vatican Council, we say that uh, science has its own authority, must be done in a human way. So, I mean, the science must be done by people who have conscience, that's all. But it is not the matter of the faith to correct the sentences of the science, especially natural history. It's completely different uh, idea when we speak about uh, creation. When we speak about creation, what is important for us is not how did God create the world. What is important is what does it mean that we are created. That means we are dependent on his will. Now, there is a small gap between God and us. And the small gap is that I am a creation. And this is much more difficult for human beings today to believe that than to discuss the matters of evolution. Because when I say that God is creator and I am created, that means I depend in my being on him. So I am not, begin, I am not beginning of myself. This is not my task to describe my beginning and my end. I am not a life giver. And I am also not a life giver to everything surrounding myself. There's a wonderful encyclical letter by Francis, Laudato Si. And Francis says that we are, we are very careful not to use the word creation. We say nature. Nature is a task for the science. You know, we have all the equipment to, to trace the nature and to say what the nature is and what we can do with the nature to serve us, you know, to be useful for us. But when we say creation, that means that the world is given to me by God. And this is also a, a sign of his trust to me that I will uh, not use the world in a wrong way and that I can be responsible for the world because it is created and it's given to me as a task and not as my own thing you know, to do whatever why I want to do. So Benedict XVI, he said that to, pro to proclaim today the dogma of creation is more important than to proclaim the dogma about redemption. Because there is nearly no human being wanting to accept the truth that we are created. But this is what we say about creation, not how did it take place. No, this is not a matter of faith. This is a matter of science. Do your thing and we will follow. I have the same conception. Um, I have not faith in uh, the theory of Darwin. Uh, science and faith are uh, two separate fields that um, have to come in dialogue, in dialogue one with the other, of course, but they are two separate fields. Why? Because the great difference between faith and science is this. If you propose a theory, you have to prove the theory. You have to go to the laboratory and to make experiments to show that your theory is true. Faith, you cannot prove. Uh, not to kill a person, it's, it's a matter of faith at the end. Because you cannot demonstrate in a logical way that it's bad to kill or to rope or to perform something wrong to a person, 
or the opposite, that it's very good to have mercy. No, the human values is also a matter of faith. Now, uh, of course, that uh, religious um, uh, people uh, have to respect the consequences, the, 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 the results of, uh, of science, the, the conclusions of science. But there is a great difference. The challenge of each scientific theory is to be improved by the new one, yeah? Newton was improved at the end by Einstein. And the idea is that it will come another person and will uh, get at the end the, the, whole, uh, the, the whole theory, uh, the, the whole theory relating all the, uh, all the forces in nature. Um, the first chapter of Genesis is not a book, not of biology and not of geology, uh, not the, the, we have not the, uh, the description of the Big Bang. Meanwhile, the Big Bang is a very good theory. Why? Because it answers uh, uh, a lot of questions proved by laboratory experiments. But the most important thing of the first chapter is, as it was said, as there is a creator who produced this Big Bang, Meanwhile, Big Bang in the future, who knows uh, how, uh, what it's going to be, the, the, the more accurate uh, description of the beginning of the universe. And uh, the most important is who human being is, that we have a spark of God in our, in our being. Psychology is very important. It describes a great part of us. But our belief is that we have a spark of God which is much more than what we use to understand as psyche, much more, some kind of intuition, which differences us from all the other creatures. This is our, our uh, as I defined it at the beginning with a German word, Weltanschauung. Thank you very much. And really, uh, the last question, very last, we are two, okay. We are two, two last questions, here and here. But please, shortly ask. Proszę króciutko zadać pytanie, dobrze? I don't know if I manage, but I try. The first thing is, uh, uh, the bishop said uh, the story about the Pope who visited the, um, uh, the temple, the Jewish temple in Roma, synagogue, uh, and uh, said that uh, maybe for us, for Christians, for Christianity, for Catholics, it was a new beginning. I see the same fact in another way because I think it was a little bit too late. It took so long. Uh, and. Uh, Rabbi said something about identity of Jewish, about the connection between the religion and the nation. Uh, I don't want to criticize you, absolutely, but in Poland we had two traditions, as much as I see my country. The first one is the tradition of tolerance, romantic tradition where all nations and cultures could be Polish, living together in peace, and another tradition which we haven't uh, even started to talk about enough is the nationalistic tradition and the uh, combination the nation and the catholic catholicism because the nationalism in poland were built on catholicism not only on ethnic theory but to be a polish for polish nationalist nationalists were to be a catholics and the results of that thinking which for me is against the, of the Polish tradition, were very bad. And we even haven't started to talk about it, about the role, not in Holocaust, because it was not our fault, not we, we haven't started, but we participated. And Polish nationalism, uh, that was something what is uh, for me the, the evil, 
something what uh, gave us not only the shame, but uh, the result of it was uh, just the death, just uh, not help to our brothers, which were not only the citizens, because for me, Jewish living in Poland were Polish. I don't call them Jewish only. And I cannot imagine the Polish culture without Jewish poets, which were Polish, and the language, their language were Polish. The first language very often were Polish. So uh, the question is, uh, I give you an example from uh, the little group, religion group uh, in uh, 16th century in Poland. It was a great time in Poland, which were called official the, the state of two nations, the Republic of two nations. And there were many nations living there together. I, I'm talking about 16th century. It's a great time for us. And there was a little group, and they were called Polish uh, brothers. It's funny for today. Polish brothers. And uh, one of them said, we must tolerate each other because maybe we are wrong. All of us can be wrong. And that's why we must tolerate each other. Not because we are uh, the, uh, keeping the truth, but we can be wrong. And that is, uh, that is the question. Is, the, is this easy for you, Rabbi, and for you, my bishop, uh, to say something like, maybe I'm wrong, that's why I need the brother who thinks another way. Thank you. Uh, maybe the first thing I will say is that uh, It is not to the end the truth that there is no discussion on the subject. And uh, I hope you will uh, get a copy of, uh, of the document uh, signed by Polish Episcopate about the difference between patriotism and nationalism. There is a document written by Polish bishops and it's not as old, it's just one year old. I remember myself signing the document. Um, the nation is a value. The nation is a community which gave me my language. And in my language, there are many values implanted. It's a beautiful poem by Czesław Miłosz when he says that my language leads my hand. That's why I write truth with a big T and injustice with a small u. Yeah. So the language is important. Yeah. We here have in Poland different streams of our tradition, different streams. Yeah. And um, this is always our choice, which way we want to, to follow. Yeah. There is something we call Jagiellonian tradition, and going back to the 16th and 15th century quoted by you. But uh, to, 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 to say it very shortly, nation is a value. Nationalism is, uh, uh, is a blasphemy when you place the nation uh, higher than your God. God must be the first. If you place God beneath the nation, this is something which is blasphemy. And um, that sentence is in the document. I remember when I heard it, because I was terrified. It was said for the first time in, um, at least to my knowledge, in church's history, by Pope Pius XI in his document Mit Brenende Zorge in 1937. And uh, the document was written in Germany, in, in, in German because it was dedicated to, to German nationalism. Yeah. So now you have the same nearly quotation, quotation in Polish bishops' conference document. Yeah. You cannot play, place the, the 
the nation, the idea of the nation, higher than your God. So the nation is a huge value. The one problem is that you need to put the value of nation in the right proper order. And then you follow your God also being Polish. You follow your God being Polish. To be Polish is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a huge attraction in being Polish. It's not against anybody. So follow your God and do not uh, and do not be afraid of being Polish. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, in order to clarify um, my answer regarding uh, the Jews in Israel and so on, um, what uh, I hope will be pragmatized in Israel is a democracy as it is. Israel is a, a full democracy. Is uh, works since the very day of its establishment at the state, a full democracy, with all the difficulties that a democratic uh, uh, system has. But uh, you know, as Churchill used uh, to say, this is the best with uh, what we have. Another system, a better system, we have not. And the second point is that I hope that Israel will continue being forever a democratic state and not a theocratia, yeah? and not a theocratic state. Um, the religions must fulfill a very special spiritual task in each society with respect, with uh, sensitivity, and so on, and so on. But the structure of each society must be democratic. Why? Because democracy, when it is a real democracy, and not a fake democracy, not when it is not merely a title, a definition, but we are, when you can build up and to build up a real democracy, you need the participation with a democratic way of thinking of the whole society. In Argentina, we have a, a, the more formally a democratic uh, system. Thanks God. Thanks God. But to live in a democratic country means that the citizens of of that country knows how to behave and to defend democracy. This is this is a very important a very important point. Is this is uh, what I wish for Israel, for Argentina, and even for Poland? Democracy means first and foremost to develop really what we did here: dialogue and a respectful dialogue from one towards the other, to know the other, to make an empathic relationship with the other, and so on, and so on, and so on. It, this is what, and I stress this point, what I tried to say at the beginning when I, I explained what, what means Israel. What, and what is Israel? Because uh, at, uh, ultimately, uh, we are just a part of a chain in the history, a continuation. And we must take, a, we must pay attention to what appeared, to what occurred us in the past, to ratify what is wrong in the possibilities that we can do that, and to project an improvement of our own being for the future. Could you, could you, sorry, Abraham, could you add also, because all the evening you are talking about the 
uh, Christians and uh, Judaic things. I want to ask you about your feelings about Poland and Poles. You have Polish roots. You are Argentinian Jew living in Buenos Aires, but you have roots here in Łódź in Balut, in Bauty. So what are you feeling about Poland? The question was about also about uh, nationalism and about patriotism. Uh, so could you tell us something? Undoubtedly that in the 20th century, I don't know exactly what happens and how it happens before, because something is to study history and something, and something quite different is to, to hear history from, uh, from the people that live that uh, history. I had the testimonies of the generation of my grandparents who came to Argentina, who, was, who literally escaped from Poland for hunger and anti-Semitism. In 1938, what was a pogrom in, in, in what city in Poland? Shitty. Is And uh, in order not to go so far, there is a wonderful document uh, prepared by, by Jacques Maritain, a great Christian th uh, 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 theologian, uh, great. And he um, uh, addressed a conference about the situation of the Jews in Europe, 1938. Uh, it's, it was published in French and uh, for my uh, great uh, surprise, also in Spanish in Argentina in 1938. And he describes the situation of the Jews in all the countries, especially in Poland. And at the end of his conference, a uh, uh, large conference, is he says, uh, he speaks to the Polish people do something that could be a, an example for all Europe, because I know your your beliefs and your uh, your values. Uh, help the Jews. Something uh, I don't remember exactly exactly the words, but he calls Polish people to help to help the Jews. Of course, that uh, I would say this is some kind of trauma but from the other side the jews of the generation of my grandparents and even my father when they used to speak about poland they refer to poland as yiddish i will repeat the altaheim the were our old uh, home and they had a special feeling regarding Poland. And don't forget that uh, Poland was one of the most important uh, places in our 2,000 years of diaspora in the creation and recreation of Jewish culture. Rab uh, rabbis, intellectuals, writers, poets, a lot of culture was established here. And the main question, why Jews continue living in Poland during thousand years? Because the history of Jews in Poland is a history of thousand years. So, and uh, I remember uh, regarding the sentiments of my father regarding Poland some mixed sentiments. From one side, okay, was a place of difficulties. But from the other side, they did consider Poland as their place. Till, of course, the Shoah, till the Second World War. So what is our mission? Our mission is to um, to study a lot of history of the Jews in Poland and to 
rebuilt, rebuilt, in order to honor all that history, to rebuild new the relationships between Jews and the Polish people. Uh, uh, the blood of my ancestors, the corpses of my ancestors are here, and the blood of my ancestors uh, and the ashes of my ancestors are in the in the places of the concentration camps uh, here. But the idea is not to come to Poland only for grief, but to come in the future to work a lot in order to come to Poland to life. You are very welcome. Okay. Uh, Archbishop doesn't want to say amen for the end. I want to thank you very much, the uh, Rabbi Abraham Skurka. Bravo. And Archbishop Grzegorz Ryś. I am honored uh, you accepted our invitation. We are very happy. I hope we'll continue. And uh, just uh, for the end, the anecdote. Today, uh, before, before, uh, before this meeting, we discover in the internet that it will be meeting uh, Archbishop Gregory Links meets Abraham Peel in the Marek Edelman Center in Boat. So I hope it was, my English was not so bad. <laughs> anyway, thank you very, very much. And please visit us very often. And you too. Thank you. A pana zapraszam tutaj już do rozmowy już. Thank you.